So occasionally we're in an ongoing series uh, called This Is Us. We started this years ago about telling our stories, and I thought on Mother's Day that it would be fun to hear a story from a, uh, a mom. And so, uh, and so I uh, um, hornswoggled my daughter and sharing her testimony this morning. So let's pray for her and, uh, and hear that, all right? Lord, I thank you for Brittany, dear God, and, you know, what a personal blessing she has been uh, to her mom and me, dear Lord. But we lift her up today and uh, pray that uh, you calm her nerves and that she just shares from her heart, dear Lord, and that we can see and hear and feel and understand your divine work in her life, dear God, the times when she knew it the times when she didn't, dear Father. Open up our hearts that we too can connect and um, uh, to your love and, um, and your awesome work in our lives, dear God, even when we don't always see it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. So I have the great privilege to share my story, or at least a little bit about my story uh, with you guys today. So... I don't know how many of you guys know about the King family, uh, <laughs> but they collect kids. <laughs> uh, all four of us are adopted from different homes, um, and this is kind of where my story starts. Um, being an adoptive kid is always different, uh, whether you knew your adoptive family or whether you know your biological family. Um, there is a lot of identity that comes with knowing who you are and where you're from, adopted or not. Um, so I was lucky enough to actually be adopted by my aunt and uncle. Joel is my biological uncle, and that has been the greatest uh, gift to me was to be adopted by family. Um, however, there is another side to that. Uh, due to that, I had ongoing contact with my biological family, which for some people is not a good thing. And for me, it was not really a good thing for most of my elementary to teen years. My biological family is chaotic, disorganized, and most of them are drug users or alcoholics. So having constant contact with this, it was a good way to show me that this was not something that I should be doing with my life. But on the other hand, it was showing me, oh, look how fun. Look what you could do instead of you know, staying on the right path, staying sober. Uh, so definitely had multiple inputs there, um, and that did affect my relationships, my friendships, my, my true relationships were based on these broken relationships that I had with my family members, including my biological parents who never gave me support. Half the time they would call me for finances or to burden me with their problems, but I would never be able to do the same. So, I grew up in the church. I grew up with all the Bible stories. I grew up knowing most sermons. I, you know, I was around a community who loved Christ, but I never truly adapted it to myself. With these broken relationships and codependency issues that I had when I was young, it made it very hard for me to develop a faith. So, my relationships were broken. I didn't really have a proper foundation for what a good relationship looked like, besides the obvious uh, role models that my parents set. I still think they're one of the best couples I've ever met, but I'm a little biased. <laughs> so, through school, again, I had a spiritual faith, but it never really truly was mine. Um, until a moment in high school where I had created my own community within a program called FFA. So for those of you who don't know, uh, that is Future Farmers of America, and we are not just an animal showman program. We are a leadership program, and I am still involved to this day. Um, my junior year of high school, 
I was elected to be one of the six people running our chapter of the program, which I thought was great. I was running the community. I thought I had a stable foot place in my high school career. Um, but again, my spiritual health was just so-so. Didn't really know who I was. Kind of knew that there was a God, but what did he mean to me? What, what, what was he doing for me? So I got to go on a school trip, which is great. Uh, you know, you get to spend time away from your parents and your loud siblings and go and spend time with your friends, stay up late and party. But for me, this was slightly different. There were, above us, six people who run the entire state of California, students who run FFA organization in the state of California. And two of those happened to be twins. Um, and I didn't know them very well. I had met one of them um, when they came to visit our chapter, but I didn't really know much about them. But at this conference, I noticed they were spending a little bit more time with me, which was kind of odd because I'm not an extrovert by any means. Like, I'll talk to you if you talk to me, but most of the time I'm happy to sit in the back and watch everybody else do what they're doing. Um, later on the night of the, f well, the, our first night that we were there in Monterey, we were in a hotel that was eight to ten stories high, kind of looked like a donut. So ring around and you're looking straight down into this beautiful floral arrangement thing. I kind of looked like a tropical water land I, it was weird it was it was completely weird um and these twins said hey do you have a moment we'd like to talk to you about your leadership it's like yeah for sure so we take an elevator up to the highest story so the eighth or tenth floor and they bring me to the edge and they ask me what i see and I just state the obvious. I'm like, we're very high up. I'm very uncomfortable up here. Can we can we go back down? They say, no, we, we have we have something to tell you. We know you. I was like, you know me. They're like, yeah. We've had dreams about you for the last two weeks. And God's been telling us that you need to hear something. And I'm like, all right, I've heard of some pretty odd things, but what are, we, what are we talking about here? These two spent the next 20 minutes or so telling me my life story, telling me things that I didn't even know about myself, things that I had actually planned to do, but I had never really told anyone about it. Never really talked about my mental health to uh, any of my family, to a anyone really. And they had told me the exact place that I was at that time. Their main message to me was, hey, God is here. He is not just a thing. He is involved with you. He is there beside you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what comes your way, he is here. That was the biggest spiritual jump start that I had, where I finally started to call my faith my own and tried to walk in my faith with Jesus. I had a very rough high school experience, so this whole revelation was something that um, definitely gave me comfort in the fact that I was not alone. All those years feeling as an adoptive child, I was walking alone because nobody understood the problems that I was going through. All of that was just a lie built by myself. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen the crazy little three-year-old running around, <laughs> jumping around. Uh, that is my beautiful baby girl, Elena, um, who obviously is always with my, my dad. He, they are <laughs> inseparable. <laughs> Not always a good thing, guys, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but let me tell you a little bit about that experience, becoming a mom. I found out that I was pregnant 
my year after high school, year after graduation, um, with me being in a relationship with not somebody who was abusive, not somebody who was mean to me, but had no emotional attachment to me. Um, when we found out that I was pregnant, I ran to him at 2 in the morning and was like, what are we going to do? Because I can't, I can't stay pregnant. I'm going off to college. Can't, can't do that. <sighs> that day, we scheduled my abortion. Had the date set. Everything was ready to go. I even had a home that I was going to be hiding in so that my parents would not suspect anything. The day after, my parents confronted me. They were not mean, they were not violent, but they were inquisitive. Why are we doing this? Why are you moving forward with this? As an adoptive kid, why aren't we looking at other options? So, me being already torn with this decision, I decided to go to a clinic, a real options clinic. They told me that I was seven weeks along, and from the moment that I saw my daughter's heartbeat, I decided that abortion was not the way for me, um, and I had decided on moving through with an open adoption, because if I was going to have my daughter, I would like that relationship with her. A couple months down the road, I was so bonded to this beautiful little thing that I decided, all right, I'm putting it all in. Going to try this mom thing out, see how that goes. My partner, on the other hand, um, was not swayed. I had convinced him to stay around until two weeks after we came home, and then he could leave. And that's exactly what he did. So in the midst of us coming home, I had a very hard labor. There were complications. It took me longer to heal than expected. And with my partner being gone and leaving me, the one person that I thought would stay um, or hoped would stay, I fell into a very deep postpartum depression. Um, this depression actually made me partially suicidal. Because I saw my daughter, I loved my daughter with everything that I had, but this loss and loneliness that I was feeling every day was just too much. It felt like it was too much. And what I wasn't seeing was the community around me. From the moment that uh, we announced to the church that I was pregnant, um, I had had an overwhelming amount of support from most people in the church and even out. I had amazing support structure, but I wasn't seeing it. It's very hard for me to see through the pain and the loss and the physical pain. So it took me a while. Um, when Ella turned three or four months old, I started to notice things. And I wasn't caring for myself. I wasn't showering normally. I wasn't eating on a normal basis. I wasn't taking care of myself. I was taking care of my child, but I was not taking care of myself. At two in the morning, I get a call from one of my biggest supporters. Her name is Sheila. I see her as a second mom. And she's just checking in on me. She knows I'm going to be up at 2 in the morning feeding Ella, so why not? If she's up in the morning, why not? She told me she knew exactly what, she, what was going on, how I felt, and what were we going to do about it. So now I was getting constant calls and constant check-ins from somebody else, even in hours that most people would be asleep. Um, and I started to realize I'm not alone. I feel like it. I'm burdened by this loss, by this rejection from my partner, but I'm not alone. 
I started to see the community around me as they're starting to take turns with my child in watching my child and my parents included, even though I had kind of been ignoring it at first, starting to realize that I had the support I needed to be able to do this. I was able to be a mom. I was able to push forward. My spiritual health throughout this entire thing has never remained the same because God gave me the greatest gift in the world, my daughter. But everything that's come with it, I would still do it over again. Everything for her. So let's talk about me now. I still struggle with these things. My mental health is still something that is a constant roller coaster. I still deal with depression and anxiety. Um, but so many things have happened. Due to his grace, I have been sober for four years. No more drug use, no more alcohol. I struggle with my identity all the time. Am I a mom? Am I a student? Am I a tech? Am I all of this? But that doesn't dictate what I do. That doesn't dictate how I act. I have pushed myself through school, and as of this Tuesday, coming Tuesday, I will have graduated my program. And of course, as all the moms out there know, things are ever changing with toddlers. So, oh my, <laughs> am I learning more about myself through my child and how she is a mirror image of me, which terrifies me, but honestly, a little bit funny there. Uh, <laughs> what goes around comes around, guys. <laughs> For those of you who haven't had kids yet, it will hit you. Uh <laughs> and I am starting to value myself. Instead of throwing myself into these worthless relationships, I am starting to value myself and my worth, and I'm not allowing myself to be burdened by my biological family and people who are using me for who I used to be. I am in a steady relationship, and I feel loved and cherished instead of used. Things change. My story definitely has. So probably the one thing I would say to you guys. Your past doesn't dictate your future. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like there was any moment where the spirit wasn't with you, where God wasn't walking with you, I just challenge you to look back. Really look at it. Because most often than not, you're going to see it that little thing, that little spark where he was with you, and whether that decision that you made in your past, whether it could have changed or whether you were protected or even how it affected your future. You'll see him. If I had moved forward with my abortion, who knows where I would be now. But I didn't because of him. God is good, everyone. That's just a little of my story. There's plenty more to it, but I am not going to uh, go through <laughs> all of that. Um, am I on? Yeah, here I am. <clears throat> so as, as, we, as you kind of hear that story, I think it's important, again, to put it in a context um, of um, Brittany was blessed to be raised in a church, and um, uh, her parents did a lot of things well did a lot of things not well, especially her father, but, um, but she had a good, a good start and a, and a great, but in the, in the midst of that, you, you know, there's, there's this, this struggle, and so as I was kind of reflecting, I'm like, God, what do you want me, what thread do you want me to pull out of this for our, our congregation in the short time that we have here at the end, and, 
And so this is where he led me. And, and there's a story in Matthew chapter 14. You're probably familiar with it if you've been around the church at all. Starting in verse 23, um, Jesus dismisses the crowd. And it says, uh, after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already, because the disciples left, a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And during the fourth watch of the night, it's between, somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., so he is praying late into the evening. Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, which is amazing, but that's not really what this story is about. Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They were freaked out. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. It's amazing at all that they've seen. They just naturally assume the worst. They live, they've been living with Jesus. They just saw a crowd fed with a very little amount of food. One bag, you know, one lunch bag where the food fed thousands. And they freak out as their first response. And they, and they cried out in fear, it says, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Look, says Peter, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water. Now, on the surface, this seems like an amazing statement. Out, out of anything that Peter could have said, if, you know, if it's you, I would have said, you know, maybe do a jig, you know, just to see if he'd do it, right, or something like that. Um, um, you know, or, or you give me this little bit of information about, you know, our, our private conversation so I know it's you and not whatever. But no, Peter says, if it's you, then tell me to come out to you. And, and one of the reasons for this is, is because when, in, in this day and age, when a rabbi invited you to follow me, become his Talmud, what we translate disciple, his invitation wasn't just, hey, come to my school and graduate. What he was saying is, is that I believe that you can be like me. I believe you can understand the Torah like me. I, I believe that you can live life like me. I, I believe it, it was more than just about learning. It was about your entire life. So in essence, when Jesus invited Peter and the other disciples to follow me, he was saying, I believe you can become like me. Well, if Jesus can walk on water, then the assumption is I can too. And so, and so he, he says, hey, if it's you, Jesus, cry, come out to me. And then, of course, Jesus replies, verse 29, come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt and when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshipped him, worshipped him, he is God, saying, truly you are the Son of God. So, so the question I think you got to ask is, why does Peter sink? And on the surface it might seem, well, you know, he, he, was, he was worried about Jesus, but the truth is he's not worried about Jesus, because Jesus is not sinking. It actually says, right, it says in, in, in the verse, right, he all of a sudden began to look at the wind. He looked at the waves. He began to look at this storm. And then he began to calculate. But he's not calculating Jesus. He's calculating Peter. And in that moment, he's like, Jesus has got the wrong guy. It's himself that he doubts. It's, it's what, whatever it was that Jesus saw in him, that's what he doubts. And that's, that's part of, of the story that Brittany is, is unfolding is, is there are times when God has miraculously showed up and provided strength and insight and, and, and miracle. But in between that, there is some very real life stuff. There is my parents, my biological parents, abandoned me there is you know that these people that that i still am reaching out for that i want to depend on are not dependable and 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 i'm just something to be used not something to be loved there is the there is the storm and the wave of right of the of the laundry of the of having a job the stress of paying the bills the the you know 
the fact that a day is coming to celebrate a mom and you didn't have one or you had a terrible one. And it's easy to begin to sink. Not because you don't believe in God. Because you stop believing that God, what he, the very thing that he said, I'm going to make you a new creation, that he got it right. He obviously got me wrong. He got the wrong person. Because I look at these circumstances and I'm not that. What, what ultimately we need is that we need faith that Jesus can do in us what he said he would do. Because he called us, not, not remember when he, uh, when he called Peter? He didn't call Peter and said, um, follow me, work really hard, and you will be a fisher of men. He didn't say that. He said, follow me, and I will make you a fishers of men. See, it's his work. That's why we need the faith that Jesus can, that Jesus can do in us what he said that he would. It's not about your effort. It's not about my effort. It's about his power, believing that his power flows and that he can do what he said that he can do. Faith in our identity through Christ. Now, identity is defined as the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. I think I got a slide with this definition. Identity is the distinguishing character or personality of an individual or the relation established by psychological identification. It is, you know, uh, Brittany mentioned some, some titles, you know, am I, a, am I a mom, am I a vet tech, am I, right? It's, it's when, when I look in the mirror, when I think about myself, what is that distinguishing character? What is that distinguishing thing that I look at? And then the second thing in the back of my mind is I look at that distinguishing character and I'm like, am I any good at that? And if I'm not, guess what? I pick something else. But that doesn't work because we really know ourselves. And so there's this brokenness. There's this loneliness. There's this isolation. And our identity dictates our behavior. Our identity is the basis for risk. The, 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 the real question, or the real trick, I guess you could say, is where are your eyes? See, Peter sank because his eyes are on the waves and not on Jesus. Let me give you a short illustration, okay? I'm, I'm about to be done, all right? Let me tell you about Tor, uh, Terry Horton. I got a picture of her here. This is Terry Horton here on the left. Uh, Terry Horton uh, was pursuing, or she, I'm sorry, she was going through a thrift store in San Bernardino, California. And she was looking for a gift for a friend, and she came across this lovely canvas. And uh, she didn't particularly like this picture, but she thought it would match the multicolors in her friend's home. And so she bought this painting for $5. Uh, it turns out her friend wasn't too appreciative either, but uh, thought, well, maybe, you know, I'll put it up there for a time, you know, because it's a gift from a friend. But she couldn't fit this five and a half foot by four foot painting canvas into her trailer home. And so uh, Terry decided I'm going to sell it at a garage sale. Upon seeing the painting at this garage sale, um, an art teacher surmised that this, act this painting could actually be done by a famous artist by the name of Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock. And this painting could be worth up to $50 million. She was actually offered, she was actually, I mean, there's, there's still debate about whether it was or not, but she was offered $9 million cash for this painting. Now, let me ask you, do you think that Terry's opinion about the painting had changed? <laughs> yes! Yes! Why? Because she no, no longer saw it as, in the context of the thrift store where she bought it $5.00. Now she saw it through the context of those who were experts in art that were saying it's worth millions of dollars and some willing to pay millions of dollars. So here's the fundamental question for you and I this morning. Who do you believe? Who do you believe? Do you believe the world that says basically you have a $5 worth of value? 
Do you believe, you know, we all have those tapes. Maybe it was a parent saying you're not worth very much. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was friends. Maybe it was a work environment. Maybe it was, it was different things that you tried that you fail at and, and the crowds or the whoever. What is it? Do you believe that? Because here's the reality. The reality is no matter what thrift store, garage sale story you have, if you want to know your value, look at the cross. There is nobody more creative than God. There is nobody who understands the value of things than God. And when God looked at you, when God looked at Brittany, when God looked at Joel, when God looked at you, he said, he, she, is worth my son. And the son left the throne of heaven, lived among those that he created, and suffered even unto death on a cross. Now you can know that. We talk about that all the time. You can say amen to that. And and that's one of the great things about church. I think sometimes we come, we have a bad week, we come, we start worshiping, and we're reminded. And for that small window, we're like, yes, yes, yes. The problem is we leave this place And we begin to look at the waves. Right? I can guarantee you, her three-year-old is not going to rise up and call her blessed today. (laughs) At three years old, it's this is a Mother's Day is just it's she's wondering what mom's gonna do for her on this special day. The waves are the waves are waiting for us. But the we have a choice. Who do we believe? And I and I and here's what I think. You know what the trick is? Where you put your eyes. Are you going to put your eyes on? Because the truth is that, you know, that she did buy the painting for $5. The truth is it, it was up for sale at a garage. Those are true things. Those, there are true things in your life where you messed up, somebody else messed up. You can't undo those things. But that is not where your worth lies. That is not where Brittany's worth lies. Our, our worth lies and what God did for us, and what he said he will do in us, that he will make you and I a new creation, that we are his child, regardless of what thrift store or garage sale we should have been at or we were at. God paid billions worth even more than that for you and I. Father God, I just thank you for that kind of love. And Lord, this is so easy to preach. It's so easy to say. It's so easy. You know, I saw everybody nodding their heads, dear God, but yet we still don't believe it. We're sinking. So Lord, as we reach out today and say, help, Jesus, because you're not sinking. We know you're solid. Would you take our hand and lift us out once again? And help us not to doubt your love. Help us not to doubt our worth. Help us not to doubt that you said you would do in us what we cannot do ourselves. And I pray that, dear dear Lord, in the midst of a day where we celebrate moms, the good, the bad, and the ugly. May May we, dear Lord, understand That no matter how well mom did or how well she didn't do, no matter how good our mom was or she wasn't there, dear Lord, um, our value, our worth comes through you and what you did for us and what you will do in and through us. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.